Good morning, everybody. Welcome to church. It's so good to see you today. Why don't you stand to your feet? We are going to worship Jesus together. But before we do, I'm going to open us up in prayer. God, you are so good, so wonderful, so incredible, and it is our greatest joy and privilege to come together this morning and lift your name on high and worship you. We invite you here, Jesus, and we love you so much, and it's in your wonderful name that we pray, and everybody says, amen, amen. amen. Let's worship together. If you're excited, put your hands together. I give you my attention, all my focus, pushing off the limits. In this moment, I feel your spirit moving all around me. Come and have your way. I'm looking at the dry bones, you're reviving this faith inside of me. From the 
rising sun to the setting, sing my will, praise your name. Great is your faithfulness to There's nothing you can do, you're faithful and true. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to pass. Great is your faithful. your faithfulness to me. From the rising sun to the setting, say my will praise your name. Is your faithfulness
take the broken things and raise them to glory. You are my champion. Giants fall in you stand undefeated. Every battle Jesus, you are our champion over every trial, over every trauma, over every tragedy. God, you are our victor. You are our savior. And in this moment, we just cast every care and anxiety and burden on your shoulders because you deeply care for us. God, we don't walk through anything alone because you walk side by side with us. And in this moment, we set our eyes on you, Jesus, and we declare that we are trusting you with every part of our lives because you are are our champion and we celebrate your victory on the cross as we live out our lives in pursuit of you as our father as our healer as our restorer God you are so good so wonderful so faithful and in this moment we just set our eyes on you
We trust you. We love you with everything that we have, God. We are coming after you this morning. And it's in your wonderful, amazing, incredible name that we pray. And everybody says, amen, amen and amen, amen and amen. 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 It is so good worshiping Jesus and declaring his goodness, isn't it? Well, good morning, good morning. It is so good to see you. You know, for us, church is like family, so get to know the people around you. Give somebody a hug or a high five. We are so glad that you are here with us today. Good morning. So good to see you today. Welcome to church. Hey, if I've had a chance to come say hi personally yet, my name is Tyler and we just want to welcome you here. We are so glad that you're here. As you walked in, you probably saw that come as you are on the outside of the building. Well, we want you to know that no matter who you are, no matter what you're going through, no matter what you came in those doors with, we know this for a fact that God loves you, God cares about you, He is with you, He is for you, and we're just excited to see what God's going to do in your life as you follow Him and trust Him. And for us, church is not a service to attend, it is a family, a community to belong to. So we want you to know your family. If you're saying, well, this is my first time, you don't even know me. Hey, we're all a hot mess. You're welcome to to the club. You're a part of the family. We are glad that you are here with us this morning. Today was actually our first 1015 service indoors, which was awesome. So if you know anybody that would love to be a part of the 1015 service, we used to do that drive-in. They can come indoors now. You can invite them. If it works out for your schedule, you can be a part of that too. And, and we just want you to do life together with us as a church because we are one team. The One of the best ways you can stay connected is through the website. You can download the app or you can fill out the connect card located in the seat back pocket in front of you. You can just drop that off in the offering or in the lobby on your way out. And we'll just send you an email once a week letting you know about the classes and services and events going on because there's all sorts of things going on and we want you to be a part of that together. One of those things is today we're doing Meet the Pastors at one o'clock. It's gonna be right after this service over in the family venue. We would love just to do lunch together, get to know you, hear about the heart and the vision, the values of the church and just get connected. And again, that's at one o'clock over in the family venue right after service. There's a couple other things too that we want you to know about. So we put that together in a video. Let's check this out together. Hey everyone, welcome to Capitol. We're so glad you're here. Here's what's happening this week. For those who attend Saturday evening service, we'd like to offer an opportunity for parents to take time and strengthen their relationships, have some downtime, or maybe just catch up on errands for the week. This is what we call date night. Free childcare is provided from 7.30 to 9.30 while you enjoy your evening. We have a trained team here loving on your kids, providing them with a meal, and also some fun activities. We do fill up fast, so we want to encourage you to come early and check in your kids. If you would like to sign up, you'll be able to do that via the check-in stations every Saturday just before service. If you're new here, you're invited to join us this Sunday at 1 p.m. for a luncheon that we call Meet the Pastors. You'll get to know Pastor Dave in a casual setting as he shares some of our history along with his vision and values. Our pastors and leaders will be your hosts and are prepared to answer questions about getting connected to our church family. Don't pass up the free lunch and child care because we want to meet you too. When it comes to getting involved at church, some of you like to crawl and some like to run. Either is okay with us. And to help you get started, we offer what we call our discipleship track which is a series of four classes that meet on consecutive Sundays from 10.15 to 12.30. For example, if it's the first Sunday of the month, we're offering class 101. If it's the fourth Sunday, 401. Each of the four classes has a different emphasis. 101 is about your relationship with God and how to become a member of this church. 201 emphasizes the habits for spiritual growth. 301 is about discovering your place in ministry. And 401 presents missions opportunities, including how to tell your story. You can sign up today on our website or by filling out the Connect card in the back of the seat in front of you. For our church family, let's get ready to give tithe and offering. Now, if you see in scripture, the tithe is the first 10% of our income we give to God 
And an offering is anything above and beyond that that God has placed on our hearts to give. Tithing is a beautiful act of trusting and obeying God, and it's amazing to see what God does in our lives when we follow wholeheartedly after Him. You can give online through the Capital Christian app or by filling out an offering envelope and placing it in the offering container at the end of service. Good morning, church. Well, come on, somebody. Welcome. So good to see you in God's house today. You know, I'm always fired up when I get to come and hang out with God's family and God's people. And uh, yeah, you look good today. You look good. Come on, somebody. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm glad you're here. Turn to the other neighbor and say, I'm glad you're here too, you know. Amen. Amen. Hey, we mentioned it in the video, but today at 1 o'clock, we have what's called Meet the Pastors, Meet the Team. And we do that because we want to really help people get connected. I'm a big believer. I believe this very deeply, that church is not meant to be something we attend. We attend a concert. We attend a movie. We attend a sporting event. But church is not something we attend. Church is a family we belong to. And family is where you find people who become friends to your destiny. Everybody needs friends to your destiny. And we want to be able to facilitate that for you. We want you to be able to be known and to know, to love and be loved, to, to care and be cared for. And I'm, I'm a big believer that people need people in their life to be friends to their destiny. So maybe you're new to the church. Maybe the military brought you here. Maybe you're new to the area. Maybe you're new to Christ. Maybe you're like, what's going on? Hey, just come and hang out with us for a little bit. About 90 minutes. We'll feed you lunch. We'll hang out a little bit. Love to get to know people. Love to get connected. And so that's going to be at 1 o'clock today. Everybody say today. today. All right, you got it. So I look forward to connecting with you there. Um, we're in a teaching series about the keys to the kingdom. And this comes from a phrase where Jesus was speaking to his disciples one day after they made a revelation of who he was. He says, I'm going to give you the keys, not key, keys, plural, to the kingdom. Keys open doors. They allow us to enter things, but they also allow us to be locked out of things. And think of it this way. These keys, they're not literal keys, but they're principles that he taught us that if I, we apply these principles, they have the ability to take us from one environment to another environment. Imagine you can be outside and it can be warm or cold, raining, freezing. It can be any number of things, but a key to a door can get you inside where there's climate control. Uh, have you ever been locked out of your own house? Come on, somebody. That's no fun. That's no fun. I got to break into my own house. The other side of it, though, we can be locked into something, and it's like, you know, it's nice outside. I would love to just get out. And, and so a key can get you out. A key can get you in, and a key can get you out. Think of it as tr transporting you from one place to another place. And so Jesus said, I'm giving you these keys, and we've been taking Sundays to walk through these keys, what they might look like. And today I want to talk about the fourth key, and that's the kingdom key of forgiveness, the kingdom key of forgiveness. Forgiveness is one of those things that if I were to sit down and interview you, if you, if you're a Christian, even non-Christians, would we say, is forgiveness an important Christian virtue? And most everybody would say, yes, it's an important Christian virtue. But if I would follow that up and say, as a Christian, do you ever struggle forgiving people? I'm going to raise up both of my hands. Come on. So you're in the right place today. It's like, it, it's, it, it's one thing to know something. It's another thing to actually know how to apply it, how to actually do it. And, and, and so we're going to talk a little bit about that today. We're going to break this down so we can understand it a little bit better. Here's what the scripture says in Ephesians chapter 4. It says, be kind to one another. I lost some of you right there. It's like, okay, it's like... I just can't even get to the kind to one another. Tender-hearted. Be tender-hearted. 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 Some of you say, I, I used to be tender-hearted. See, tender hearts are easily penetrated. Tender hearts are easily wounded. A tender heart that gets wounded becomes a hurt heart. A hurt heart now becomes a guarded heart or a defensive heart. And the more we live in life the more we risk being disappointed, hurt, disillusioned, uh, wounded. And, and, and what God is saying, I need you to know how to cycle back to a tender heart again. 
I need you to get back to an innocent heart again. And the only way I can do that is learning to forgive one another as Christ has forgiven me. Because how many know God stays tender-hearted to us? God is tender-hearted. He is kind to us. But our sin, our offensiveness literally killed his son. Come on, imagine that. Our sin killed his son. But God somehow can stay tender to us. God can still stay kind to us. And so as, as a pastor who opens his heart, I've had to learn this years ago. It's like sometimes I open my heart, and open my heart just means you get wounded, you get hurt, and I've got to learn how to go back to be tenderhearted again. I've got to learn how to get back to be kind to one another again. And so this is the principle that God is asking us to do. So as Christians, we understand we're supposed to do it, but we struggle in applying it to our life. And here's what I think one of the biggest problems is we try to do it in our own power and we don't understand God is saying, I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom. When God gives us a key to the kingdom, he's empowering us. He says, if you apply the principle, I'll give you the power to bring it to pass. And so what, what does it mean to forgive? So I'm going to talk about what is forgiveness. Then we're going to talk about what needs to be forgiveness so we can actually understand that a little bit. I want to mention a little bit about the dangers of unforgiveness because there's a reason that God wants you and I to forgive and then how to actually apply forgiveness to my life. So what, what is forgiveness? Forgiveness is the conscious, deliberate, it's conscious and deliberate decision to release feelings of resentment and vengeance towards those who have hurt me. It's a conscious deliberate decision to release feelings of resentment and vengeance towards those who have hurt me. And, and here's what happens with a lot of Christians. It's like, okay, God, I'm choosing to forgive, which means literally I'm releasing it. Now, the biblical word for forgive here, check this out. The verse we just read, when it says forgive, it means to grant a favor or to show kindness to someone you don't think deserves it. Oh, I can be a favor to someone I think deserves it. I can be kind to someone I think deserves it. No, biblical forgiveness means I, am, I grant a favor and show a kindness to someone I don't think deserves it. So here's what often happens. Okay, God, you got this high standard of forgiveness. So now I'm choosing to forgive. So I'm releasing it, God. I'm letting it go. But then as I let it go, then their thought comes to my mind. I remember them. And then I reel it back in real quick. Just come on back down. Because, because when we think of them or see them, whoever them are, whenever we're reminding of them, all of a sudden, We've not really released them because, because we actually keep them deep in our heart in a dungeon that we chain and lock them up in. And then for sport, we will bring them out <laughs> to torture them. You didn't realize that you were a master of torture. You know, you, you get your little voodoo doll and you start sticking your pins in them. You put them on the rack and you stretch them until their arms and legs come off or you want to beat them. And, and so you abuse them for a while in your mind of all the things that need to happen to them because of the pain they've caused you. So they need a good dose of their own pain. And then after we torture them for a while and we're ready to go to Starbucks, we put them back into their little torture chamber until we want to bring them out later. Come on, somebody. And we don't understand. It's like, God, I don't want to do this. But here's what I'm trying to say. True forgiveness, this thing that I'm trying to encourage you to aspire to, you're not going to be able to get there in your own power. God is saying, I'm giving you the keys to unlock something you can't unlock, to close something you can't close. So God, I need you to help me to process this so that I can let go of these feelings of resentment and hatred and anger and bitterness. Help me to let it go. Because that's what literally we're talking about here is releasing this and leaving it alone. So what do I, what is God, what am I forgiving? See, in other words, we get all these feelings, but where do they come from? There's three things that they come from. Number one is debts. Debts. A debt is something owed. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 12, forgive us our debts. Forgive us our debts 
as we forgive our debtors. It's easy to understand financial debts, right? How I many know if I owe you $100 and I give you $50, how much do I owe you? $50. It's easy to measure financial debts. But there's also moral debts. Moral debts are a whole nother ball game. We don't know what to do with those. But your moral debts are so dangerous that they can actually cost you where you spend eternity because we have debts. Here's what they're saying. God, the debts I owe you. Some of you don't even know you have debts with God. Some of you don't even know you have financial debts. <laughs> right? All right? And some of you don't know how you have other moral debts. You have moral debts, and people are offended at you, and you're offended at people because they have a moral debt to you. Let me give you some examples. A child may grow up in a home where a father is absent, not supportive, uncaring, mean, critical, and that child is feeling, you owe me love. My whole life I've tried to earn your love. My whole life I've tried to prove myself to you. My whole life, I've, I've, all I've ever wanted was just your acceptance. You owed me your love. And now I'm offended at you, Dad, because you didn't give me what I think you owed me. Parents on the other side, you owe me respect and honor. You don't know the sacrifices I've made. You don't know what I've done for you. You don't get it. You don't understand. And I'm offended at you because you owe me an honor. And you owe me a respect. These are moral. They're, how do you measure respect? In a husband and wife relationship, a spouse might say, look, you owe me your face. You get off of the phone, get present. I don't care about your job. I just want your presence. You owe me your attention. You owe me your devotion. You owe me your faithfulness. You owe me your loyalty. A friend might betray you, and you're sitting there saying, wait a minute. You owed me your trust, and you owed me your confidence. All of a sudden, this becomes real now, we realize... People have debts with us. You have a debt with me, and I have a debt with you. And they're moral debts, but they're deadly debts. We even have a, the verse is saying, Father, forgive us our debts that we have with you. Do you know God says, you have debts with me. You owe me your devotion. You owe me. You owe me your life. You, every good thing in your life comes from me. You owe me your honor. You owe me your respect. You owe me your worship. You owe me your attention. But guess what? God's still kind. He's still tender. He says, you have a debt with me, but I forgive you. So he can stay kind and tender. Because when I don't let the debt go, I can't stay kind and tender. Is this making any sense? Number two. Number two is trespasses. So I've got to learn to forgive debts, but I've also got to learn to forgive trespasses. Look what it says in Matthew chapter 6, a couple verses later in verse 14. It says, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Now listen to the warning. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. A debt is something owed. A trespass is when we cross a line or cross a boundary and create damage. Here's the thing. Sometimes people intentionally cross boundaries. I'm going to cross this boundary. I know it's wrong, but I'm going to commit adultery anyway. I'm going to cross this line. I know it's wrong, but I'm going to steal from my employer anyway. So sometimes people willingly and knowfully cross boundaries that are clearly understood, and they, they, they now become uh, violators of crossing a boundary, crossing a line. But the problem is, many times, people cross boundaries unintentionally. And we create boundaries for people, and they don't even know that there's boundaries there. And then people are crossing these boundaries that maybe they never even understood were there. And there's an expectation that we have of people that they've not even agreed to, but now they're offending us because they're not acting the way we think they should act. Jesus offended a lot of people. I mean, Jesus made people so mad. They killed him. On one occasion, there, Jesus had 
healed this guy, and they start picking up rocks. Check this out. They're picking up rocks to start throwing rocks at Jesus. This is religious people, not, 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 not the sinners. This is, this is the church people. They're so mad at Jesus. They're picking up rocks. And he goes, before you start throwing those rocks, I got one question for you. For which good work do you stone me now? Their answer was, for a good work, we're not stoning you. But because you make yourself the son of God. Okay, let me get this right. Me being me offends you. I'm not the Jesus you want me to be. And because I'm not the Jesus you want me to be, I offend you. See, some of us who don't realize we need Jesus to get back in his box. And if Jesus were to get out of our little box, he offends us. Oh, yeah, praise the Lord. Uh, by the way, you don't get to tell who Jesus is. Jesus gets to tell you who he is and whose boundaries being crossed. On another occasion, Jesus' disciples are grabbing handfuls of grain on a Sabbath, and they're freaked out. How can your disciples eat grain on the Sabbath? And Jesus, I'll tell you how. Because I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. It's my Sabbath. I created it. I can do whatever I want to with it. I, and was Sabbath created for man or was man created for the Sabbath? And they're like, you can't do that. Yes, I can. Watch me. And, and this is the kind of reason that Jesus just drove people insane because he kept crossing their boundaries. But it wasn't a boundary he agreed to. I share this with people. My wife and I have a covenant relationship. And because we have a covenant relationship, we have very high expectations of our relationships. She calls, I answer the phone. I'm someplace, I tell her where I'm at. Uh, I don't date other people, she don't date other people. We have very high expectations of each other in this relationship. As long as we do, the relationship's highly vitalized. But imagine if I tried to keep all those same expectations on her, but she never agreed to marry me. That would make me a stalker. I could go to jail for the same expectations because, but she don't agree to it. It's like, I'm not answering your phone call. I'm blocking you. I don't have to tell you where I'm at. I don't have to tell you where I'm at. What's the difference? Shared expectations. See, sometimes we create expectations that others never agreed to, and they're trespasses. So, yes, sometimes people cross the line and offend us, and it was clearly defined. But other times we're creating expectations that people never knew that was even there. When I was a young pastor, because I'm just so zoned in, I've had to really learn how to kind of be in public. I don't know if you understand. I'm just, I'm just a quiet, shy person, really. But if you would, if you ever got to know it's like, I could, my wife and I, we can sit down and just do nothing, not even talk for hours, just drive down the road. I'm, I'm just a quiet person. But when I first started in ministry, that got me into a lot of trouble with people because people assumed my quietness was a rejection of them. People assumed me not stopping and saying hi meant I didn't care about them. And I was, people were being offended at me for being me. All the while, inside of me, everything in me is about loving people. I'm just shy and awkward. <laughs> me being shy and awkward was offending people. But it wasn't my heart. So now I've learned how to be a little more bold. Learn to go say hi to people. Learn to kind of say hi first, although that got me in trouble in Africa one time. So if you know me now, it's like, hi, I'll say hi to everybody. It's like, I don't want to offend that. So I say hi to everybody. So I was in this meeting with these very important denominational leaders, and, and, and I did not get the protocol briefing on how we're supposed to talk. So I go in there, and I start shaking hands and saying hi to everybody. And then the, my, my, my person that I was with, he's just freaked out. He starts out with, I have to apologize for the pastor because the rules are, People speak, then people speak, and then I get to speak. Well, I spoke way out of turn. It's like, so, so I can't win. I don't say anything. I offend people. I say something. I offend people. Me being me is just offensive. <laughs> but I know I love you. <laughs> I know that much. I'm clear on that. I'm confused on everything else. Here's number three. Here's number three. It's complaints. Debts, trespasses, and complaints. Look what the scripture says here in Colossians. Bearing with one another. God says you have to bear with one another. <laughs> when you've been married for any length of time, 
you've had to learn to bear with somebody. There's like the first week where you have a honeymoon. And then after that, we've, we've been bearing together five years. We've been bearing with each other 20 years. We've been bearing with each If you're still married 20, 30, 40, 50 years, you've learned how to bear with one another. Because why? Forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint, if you have a complaint, a complaint against one another, even as Christ forgave you, so you must also do. A complaint is a quarrel. Some of us, we just want to get into these quarrels. We don't even know what we're arguing about. We just have to argue. We get into these power struggles. We get into these, 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 these who's right, who's wrong. And we're willing to throw the relationship away to win the argument, to make the point. And, and the Bible is saying, I've got to learn how to let go of control, let go of the need to be right, learn to not have to win the argument. Because some of you, you're really good at winning the argument, but at what cost? At what cost? You're not bearing with others because you're going to have complaints. I mean, I, I don't even need another person to have a complaint. I have all kinds of complaints against myself. <laughs> Is this making any sense? Here's the problem, though. I need to debts, trespasses, and complaints. And that's what needs to be forgiven. That's what creates all the emotions that you feel because somebody wronged you or owes you. It's a debt. Somebody crossed a line that hurts you. There's a complaint. All this creates all these emotional feelings that we have. The problem with being unforgiving is that it grows. Unforgiveness does not stay static. In God's eyes, it, it, it literally grows on the inside of us. Scripture says in, he, excuse me, in Ephesians chapter 4, be angry. Some of you need to relax. God expects you to be a fully emotional human being. Some of us are trying to get to where we don't have dark or negative emotions. No, God says you're, you're an emotional being and you're going to have these powerful emotions. You're going to have fear. You're going to have anxiety. You're going to have worry. You're going to have angry. But don't let them turn into sin. You're going to have emotional experiences. Emotions are information that's telling you something's going on inside of you. They're information. But it says don't let those emotions turn into sin, nor let the sun go down on your wrath. In other words, don't hang on to it because here's what we do. We, we go to bed with all this resentment, and then we sleep on it. We get up the next morning, we feel great. But what we don't realize is it just went into our subconscious. And that's why it's hard to let it go because we think, we think okay, it didn't, it, it's gone, it's not there. But then somebody mentions their name or we see their car or we run across them. All of a sudden it's right back up there because it went into our subconscious. And it's amazing, no matter how deep it is into our subconscious, how quickly the recall can be and how energized it is when it gets recalled. So you might know what I'm talking about. So it says, and, and, and nor give place to the devil. When I choose to be unforgiving, it's like whistling to the devil. Say, come on over. All the doors are unlocked. All the doors are wide open. Just come on over and move in here. And, and instead of using the keys of the kingdom to lock out evil, I'm not using the keys and I'm inviting it in. And in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus talks about three stages that bitterness grows into, here's what he says. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable of judgment. That makes sense. If you kill somebody, you're going to be punished for killing somebody. But now Jesus takes it into the emotional realm, and he says, but I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable of judgment. Just circle that word on your outline. We'll come back to it. Whoever insults his brother, now it's not just anger in me, now it's anger coming out of me, will be liable of the council. Circle that word council, because that's an authority. And whoever says, you fool, now I'm just, now I've just hate you. I've got this bitterness that's turned into something sour in me. Now will be liable to hell fires. Number one, what Jesus is saying is, Unforgiveness will bring personal judgment into your body. Scripture says it this way in James chapter 3. For jealousy and selfishness. These are these emotions that get going because of debts, trespasses, and complaints. Are not God's kind of wisdom. So you need to, when, when, when you are emotionally energized by the wrong emotions, 
you need to recognize it, you, you are not flowing in the wisdom of God. An angry person, when, I'm going to say it this way. When I am angry, I always know, David, don't make a decision right now because you do not have the mind of Christ. You do not have the mind of Christ. Because why? It says, such things are earthly, unscriptural, and even demonic. So when I'm making negative emotional decisions, I'm literally allowing myself to be led not by the Holy Spirit. I'm allowing my emotions to be led by, at best, my earthly wisdom, at worst, dark spiritual forces. For wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, again, these emotions that are unresolved and not released, there you will find disorder. Disorder. Some translations will say confusion. Confusion isn't something out there. Confusion is something in me and every kind of evil. So again, what is being unforgiving? It's holding on to feelings of resentment that you ruminate on. You start ruminating on my anger. I'm ruminating, meditating on my desire for vengeance. I'm ruminating and meditating on my hurt. I'm ruminating and meditating on my wound. And as I ruminate on these jealousies and these selfish ambitions, and I, as, I, as I'm thinking on these things, ruminating on these things, they're unproductive. They're information, but they're unproductive emotions for leading me in decision-making. Oh, come on, somebody. And I will tell you something. You can write this down and take it to the bank. People will make far more emotional decisions than they will make logical decisions. At your core, you will make emotional decisions far more than you will make logical or intelligent decisions. Uh, I, we've seen brilliant people mess up their life because they felt like it. Come on, somebody. And, and it's saying here that there's, it creates this disorder. And so when I begin to meditate on these things and I begin to ruminate on these emotions that I can't seem to let go, it makes me mentally sick, it makes me emotionally sick, and it will literally make me physically sick or bring physical judgment into my own body. We know this from ample amounts of research. I'll mention one. John Hopkins University, there's a researcher, her name's Karen Schwartz, a doctor, and she looks at mood disorders. And, and she's got a statement that says that there's a tremendous or an enormous, excuse me, an enormous burden the physical body carries when there are hurts and disappointments. Those emotions of hurts and disappointments create so much energy that anger, it turns into anger. That anger just starts pulsating through us and we get into this fight or flight. I will contend with you. I will fight with you even if my mind, I will battle with you in my mind or, or I will flight. I will run from you. The only problem from running from it, you still don't leave it in your mind. You might physically get away from the person, but you've not been able to get away from it in your mind. That's why some of you have moved yourself physically, maybe from a person that was abusive or painful for you, but that was 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago, but they're still right there on a recall because they went into your subconscious and it still tortures you and torments you to this day. And because it creates this energy in your body, we know scientifically that it increases anxiety, increases depression, increases heart rate, increases blood pressure, increases cholesterol, increases the rate of heart attacks, increases um, or actually decreases my immune system. So now I open up myself to all kinds of things. But the good news is, the good news is, and the research shows this, that if I can truly let it go, leave it alone and release it, how quickly my heart comes down, my blood pressure starts coming down, my cholesterol starts coming down, my anxiety starts coming down, my depression starts coming down, my diabetes starts coming down, and my immune system starts coming back up. Jesus is saying... You bring judgment into your body when we don't forgive. Here, here's the second thing. It grows, but it doesn't stay there. Remember, insult your brother. You'll be in trouble with the council. Now it moves into legal judgment. 
How many of us know somebody that has legal problems because their anger got out of control? Yeah. I'm not asking if you're that person. <laughs> I love asking men who have their arms in cast, how'd you break your arm? I've been doing this for decades. I will tell you, I have heard on multiple occasions, I broke my arm because I hit a wall. Let me get this right. You hit the wall with... That's earthly, sensual, demonic wisdom right there. What good did you think in your mind hitting that wall was going to do right now? How much work have you lost? How much are your medical bills? How about the wall you need to have to pay for now to get replaced? You're brilliant. You're literally brilliant. <laughs> That's how irrational bitterness becomes when it starts getting expressed. Look what the scripture says here in Hebrews. Pursue peace with all people. Who am I supposed to pursue peace with? People I like. People I get along with. People I have no debts with. No trespasses. No. Everybody. Help me, Jesus. I have a struggle to get along with myself. Now I've got to get a peace with everybody else. I'm mad at myself half the time. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. If I want to see God show up in my life, I've got to know how to pursue peace. I've got to learn this principle of being a peacemaker. If I want to see the kingdom of God manifest in the supernatural power of God show up and take me from one environment into another environment, if I learn how to be a peacemaker, I will see the goodness of God in my life. If you want to see the Lord, if you want to see the Lord, but look carefully, pay attention. Here's the warning. Lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Remember, the grace is the unearned favor of God. I don't want to miss any of it. But the Bible says I can fall short of it. Think of it this way. How do you fall short of the grace? The Bible says God's mercies are new every day. Every day. Imagine yourself. You know, you ever see these high wire trapeze artists? You know, they're on the rope and they're on one platform and they throw the rope to them and they grab it and they jump at it and it takes them to the other side. Think of God's grace as that rope being thrown at you, and every day it smacks you in the face. Boom. Smacks you in the face. But at some point, you've got to grab it. At some point, you've got to grab it so it can take you from one place to another place. But when I don't grab it, every day it just hits me in the face, and I fall short of it. It's, it's not that I'm earning it. It's like God saying, look, I'm just, it's, every day I'm slapping you in the face with my goodness. Every day I'm slapping you in the face with my mercy. Every day I'm slapping you in the face with my kindness. Right now, some of you are getting slapped in the face that you need to forgive. And it's like, and, and, and you're stuck. But you've got to grab that. Here, then it warns, it says, less any root of bitterness. If I stay right here, not taking the grace, any root of bitterness spring up, cause trouble. And by this, many become what? Cause myself trouble cause myself trouble listen carefully where do offensive people people who hurt people come from offended people offended people don't think of themselves as offended they think of themselves as justified <laughs> yeah did you catch it offended people don't think of themselves as offended hey if you would have been a better wife, I wouldn't have slapped you. It's your fault that I slapped you. You need to be better. My employer doesn't treat me the way they're supposed to treat me. So that's why I'm stealing this stuff. I'm taking company property. I'm stealing company assets. I'm taking stuff. I'm shortening my hours. I'm lying on my hours because they're not paying me what I think I'm deserved. I'm justified in my bad behavior. You're not the wife I want, so I'm justified in having this immoral affair. You, you're not, you don't give me enough attention, so I'm going to go have a commit adultery against you. Instead of learning how to figure out how to solve our problems, instead of bear with you and forgive you and figure this out, I, I'm now justified in me having my affair. We, see, somehow, somehow my bad behavior is your fault. And that gets me into trouble. It'll get you in jail. It'll get you locked up get you in road rage how many people have financial fines criminal fines criminal problems because they got anger out of control legal problems third is un 
ultimately, unforgiveness can grow into spiritual judgment. Spiritual judgment. In Matthew 18, is a quick parable that Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like this. And he tells a story of a master who forgives someone who has this enormous, enormous debt. And this guy's forgiven, and he's so grateful. Then he goes away and finds somebody who owes him a very, very small debt. And the guy says, would you forgive me? And the guy goes, no, I'm not going to forgive you, and actually throws him in prison. And this is Jesus' response to this, and this is one of those really challenging, hard teachings of the Bible. We like to see Jesus with the little lamb, sweet little baby Jesus. No, there are certain passages in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, that just challenge me, scare me, intimidate me. Because the fear of the Lord is a good thing if you learn to understand it. I'm afraid to hold on to bitterness. I'm afraid of what it might cost me. So God, I need to let go. I don't want to fall short of the grace. Here's what it says at the end of that story. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And the master was angry. And delivered him to what? The tortures. Some of us are just being tortured right now because we won't let it go until you should pay all that was due him. So my heavenly father, so my heavenly father will do to you if each of you from your heart does not forgive his brother his trespass. Here's what happens in so many Christians. God, thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for your kindness. God, I'm so grateful. I appreciate it so much. But somehow something goes haywire and we disconnect how God meant for that to flow through us to somebody else. Somehow, I thank you for giving it to me, but there's no way I could give it to them. Thank you for being kind to me, but there's no way I could be kind to them. And we get disconnected and it creates a hardness in our heart. And God is saying that hardness of your heart is going to get in the way of our relationship. That bitterness in your heart grows into this hardness that I can't reach you. I can't influence you no more because you get so blinded. And now you're being led by the enemy versus my spirit. This is why it's also so important. I'm going to just, my time is up, but I want to just, I want to kind of teach this next verse. In Matthew chapter 5, and I'm talking to us who are Christians. I'm talking to us who learn how to forgive. Because I do think you can learn how to forgive. But I also think it's important we learn to help others forgive. So if you are offering your gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you. You don't have against your brother, but your brother has something against you. You're coming, you're worshiping, you're bringing your gift to the altar. It goes on to say in the next verse, leave your gift there. Wow. This is how important this is to God. If you come to me, and you're bringing your gift to me, you're bringing your worship, you're bringing your devotion. God says, I just want you to stop and leave that there and go back to your brother and say to your brother, what debt do I owe you? What trespass have I committed? What complaint do you have? Because whatever you have against me, I want you to find peace. Because here's what God really wants. He wants my brother. He doesn't want my gift. He wants my brother. He wants his love to reach through me. Like it reached me to reach through somebody. And come back and say, God. Here's your son. Here's my brother. Because God knows the danger that if this person who has an offense with me don't get it healed. It'll become personal, it can become legal, and it can ultimately be spiritual. If I can help you, if I owe you a debt, I want to pay it. If I trespass against you, I want to make it right. If you've got a complaint with me, how do I fix it so that I can help you be reconciled to me and to your Father? This is the kingdom. Love God, love people. If we figure this out, you will see heaven come to earth. You will see more power of God flow in your life. You'll see more of the harmony of the Spirit. So how do we do this? Real quickly. Number one, make a deliberate choice to forgive. I make a decision to forgive. My forgiveness needs to be unlimited. There's a scripture in your outline there that Peter said, how many times should I forgive? Seven times seven. Jesus said, no, 70 times seven. 
my forgiveness is a choice I need to make. It's unlimited. The problem is, when I make the choice, I don't feel like they deserve it. I don't want to. I don't like it. It's, but it's still my choice to make. I choose to let it go. But now, God, I need to take me to number two. I need your help. God, I can't do this without your help. God, I, I, I can't do this in my own power. It's my choice, but remember, it's the keys of the kingdom. God says, you make the choice, I'll start helping you have the power. You make the choice, I'll start opening the doors. In Colossians, and see, I've got to remember, and how I get the power to forgive others is to be in light of how much God has forgiven me. That's critical. If I want to learn how to forgive others, I've got to con constantly keep in mind how much God is forgiving me. And in Colossians, it says, he canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. The cross is a symbol of a horrific, violent violation of the abuse that Jesus endured. Conflict resolution, it's either going to be emotionally bloody or it's going to turn out to be physically bloody. We have wars all over the place. We have violence all over the world. So it's either external or internal. Conflict resolution is always going to get messy. And God took my sin my debts, my trespasses, and the complaints he has against me, and he nailed it to the cross. And in light of that, God, I need to take my complaints, the trespasses that people have committed against me, and the debts I feel people that owe me. And God, as you nail mine to the cross, I want to join you in nailing theirs to the cross. And we've got a piece of paper just as a practical step on the way out. Put a cross out there. It's just a way to connect your mind that I'm going to let this go. Don't name the person. Name the pain. Name the debt that you feel owed. I'm letting it go. Name the trespass that was committed. I'm going to let it go. Name the complaint that you have and say, I'm going to let it go. God, with your belt, as you've nailed mine to the cross, I'm nailing theirs to the cross. And God, I'm asking you to bring healing into my life. Which is number three. When they come back to your mind in the future, once you've made this decision, you've asked God to help you now, the devil's going to try to bring them back to your mind. Things are going to start coming up. We get programmed. When they come back to your mind, this is really important. Instead of pulling them out and torturing them, Instead of pulling them out and thinking of all the things you want to do in vengeance, bring them out and bless them. Look what Scripture says here in Luke chapter 6. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. Bless those who curse you. Pray. I practice this all the time. God, I made a choice. God, I've asked for your power. Now when they come to my mind and I find myself fantasizing and daydreaming about the vengeance or the pain when I catch myself God I, I'm sorry God I've made a choice I've asked for your help now I pray blessing I'm not praying that you would bless their evil I'm not praying that you would prosper their evil but I am praying that they would know you I am praying that your will would be done in their life I'm praying God that they would be what you created them to be and until that and, and I keep praying for them until that painful emotion is gone until that painful thought is gone I just keep speaking blessing Romans says, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. I'm not going to speak evil out of my mouth. I'm going to speak blessing out of my life. Because your, your, your mouth, if you'll speak it, you'll teach your mind to think it. If you'll speak it, you'll... Have you ever noticed that you can read a book and daydream and think, what did I just read? But I want you to pay attention. When you speak verbally, it's very difficult to daydream. Because your mind will follow your mouth when your mouth speaks. That's a kingdom principle. That's why we speak things into existence. We speak the word of God. We speak blessing. And your mind will follow what you speak. Start declaring the blessing of God, the promises of God. And finally, number four. Number four. Is let God redeem it and turn your pain into good. See, when my pain doesn't get redeemed, I get justified and create more pain. I violate others. I hurt others. But when I let God begin to heal me, now the very place of my deepest, greatest ministry will often be in the place of our deepest, greatest pain. Because now God, as God heals us and God brings peace to us, we can identify 
empathize with people who have those kind of pains and we can now begin to minister to them and now we begin to be redeemed for good it's a scripture where where joseph's brothers tried to kill him at the end of his life they did all this evil to him and he said to them what you did you meant for evil but god has turned it and meant it for good to the saving of many people's lives I want you to think, here's this young boy, betrayed by his brothers, victimized all the way along, and God raises him up to be a prince in Egypt as a slave because he kept his heart tender. He kept his heart kind, and he unlocked the kingdom. Hey, I want you to stand to your feet and pray for you. Before you leave, on your way out, I want to encourage you name your pain and as God has nailed yours to the cross nail theirs to the cross I want to pray for you and as I pray over you I want you to begin to pray for your own life I want you to pray for your own situation if there are people and things that come to your mind if there's debts and trespasses and complaints that come to your mind make that decision say God I'm deliberately choosing to let it go God, I need your help. God, I'm blessing, not cursing. I'm blessing. And God, use it for good. Use this and turn it to accomplish something good. If you need Christ in your life, as I pray, just invite him in right now. Fill out that connect card and say, today I decided to follow Jesus. We'll follow up with you and resource you. With, you begin your journey with Christ. God comes into our life by invitation, not invasion. So we have to invite him in. He's already decided to forgive you. Now all you have to do is receive it. So, Father, I pray for this beautiful family right here. I pray for the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I pray for what you're doing in each and every life. I pray that you're accomplishing your purposes. Father, for every person that's struggling, God, release them. For every person, God, that might have personal judgment in their lives and their bodies, I pray for the healing. God, I pray blood pressure is coming down. And heart disease is coming down and diabetes is coming down and, and anxiety is coming down and depression is coming down and healing is coming and the immune system is going up as we make this decision to heal. I thank you. You're protecting people right now. They're hearing a word in season. It's going to keep them out of legal troubles. It's going to keep them out of spiritual judgment. I thank you, Father God, for the healing that comes by the power of your spirit. We can't do this on our own, so we ask for your help. Father, when they come to our mind, we're going to bless and not curse in the beautiful name of Jesus. I love you guys. Let's take a minute to worship, and hopefully I'll see you at Meet the Passes shortly. I have the authority. Jesus has given me. When I open up my mouth, miracles start breaking. Jesus, in this moment, we just invite you to help us. 
as we cancel the debts of those that have hurt us, of those that have wounded us, we invite you to heal our hearts, to help us to release the bitterness, to release the hurt and the heartbreak, and trust you in the process. And in this moment, God, we also invite you to forgive our sins, to wash us clean, to make us new in you. Jesus, we love you so much. Would you lead us and guide us this week as we look to you? We love you. And it's in your name that we pray. And everybody says, amen and amen and amen. Church, we love you so, so much. Again, we'd love to see you at Meet the Pastors at one o'clock. Have an incredible week and we'll see you next week.